You were talking about doing splits. Is there a particular time of year you do splits for your insurance for the future or next spring? Uh, yeah, we can start. That's part of this. The um, the best time I find it, it, it depends on your environment, so up here you're a little bit different than me, but uh, the earliest you want to do splits in a year is when you have swarms, swarms, uh, drones, you have drones before you have swarms, um, because you need the drones to mate with the new queen, and if you don't have the drones, and she's not going to get mated, and so I think around here it's not too much of a problem with timing because it's too cold to work bees anyway. When it gets too early like that so um, right now swarm season or just before swarm season is generally the prime time to make splits of all types so then you take away your honey crop that's true depending on how you do the splits which i'll talk about so importance of raising your own bees I've, we've already talked about this a bunch of times today i think it's super important to raise your own bees or catch swarms, things like that. Um, yeah, we've talked about all of these already. So the easiest way, I think, is to catch swarms. Um, there's a few, a few concerns that people have with swarms. Uh, a lot of times I'll hear concerns about how um, the swarms that you catch, they'll be they'll be commercial bees, they'll be package bees. Um, you don't know where they're coming from. Might as well just not do it. And I've I've never really understood when people say that because it's always a mix. Invariably, you're going to get some treated bees, which aren't going to do very well uh, over winter. A lot of times, the treated bees will will build up really quickly and give you a nice honey crop because that's what they're bred for they just won't survive but in the meantime you still get a nice batch of comb built and and maybe even a nice honey crop off of a swarm or you know a reasonable honey crop off of a swarm so I mean there's, it's a win-win there even if they if even if they die then they leave you empty comb that you can make more swarm traps with next year and maybe even harvest some honey off of also. So I don't see any reason not to for that reason. Uh, but also you're gonna be having a chance of catching wild colonies, wild swarms. Because you never know, especially in suburban areas, I've been regularly surprised by how many swarms are in suburban areas, even when there aren't any kept hives in the area. People don't realize there's a lot of times hives will be up in trees that you can't see because it's so far up in the tree. Um, Tom Seeley in Honeybee Democracy talks about the average height of a, of a tree colony being somewhere like 22 feet up. So with, with old growth trees, big trees, they're going to be way up there. You might not even notice them. Most people, most of the ones that people notice are much closer to the ground. The other thing is in buildings, especially old buildings like we have plenty of around here, you have um, a lot of times in these old buildings they were double layered brick walls and so there's a lot of cavities built into these old buildings and over time as the building gets more worn or loose or boards warp and things, gaps open up and, and cavities will become available to bees and there's there's actually a lot of wild bees living in cities like this and suburban areas and and all over the place people don't realize just how many wild colonies there are so if you can if you can get a swarm from one of them then even better um, the other thing is the the worst of the worst commercial bees generally from last year. Sometimes you'll get a swarm when, when somebody starts a package and doesn't handle it right and they'll swarm immediately and those aren't the best. But um, if, it's a, if it's an overwintered hive, which most swarms are, you're getting bees that were healthy enough to overwinter and healthy enough to build up quickly enough to, to swarm this year. So these are, these are healthy bees. And they are 
already pre-selected, even if they're commercial bees, even if they're sourced from commercial bees, they're already pre-selected that first winter. You, you're kind of already one step up. So swarm catching is, is just a good, good all around. And, and I, I recommend swarm traps, which is I'm going to be doing uh, how to build a swarm trap in the next talk uh, because not everybody has the opportunity to uh, be on a swarm call list or not everybody can get away from work to get out to, to go catch swarms and so by having swarm traps the swarms kind of come to you and you don't have to be on the list you don't have to you know keep a hive in your car and etc it just it's by being prepared by getting swarm traps out before swarm season you already have it working for you and you don't have to you can just sit back and wait for the wait for the swarms to come to you and uh, one of the things that my friend Jason Bruns taught me, um, he's so into swarm trapping, he doesn't even really do splits anymore. He's, he's caught so many swarms and he knows the characteristics of the swarms from various areas around, around where he lives in Indiana that he's given up like successful spots where he's caught swarms because he didn't like the bees there. So he focuses his swarm catching on the areas where he likes the bees. So in doing that, he's doing, he's kind of like selective breeding for his operation. He's, he's getting the bees he wants and the ones he doesn't want, he just gives away. So if you're wanting to do some splitting, or any sort of artificial expansion, anything other than swarms. This is good to know for swarms too. It's important to know the math for when, how the process of making a queen happens. Because if you're gonna, if you're gonna split a hive, then you're gonna need to know that it's gonna be about 25 days, well, minus the first three or four usually, so at least three weeks minimum, before you'll have a new queen laying eggs in your new split all right so by adding a uh, a pre-mated queen from somewhere else you can cut that three weeks right off and she'll be laying almost immediately you can manipulate these things that way so day one queen lays the egg most of us are familiar with basic bee biology day four is uh, the larva will have hatched Hatched is kind of a relative term. Basically hatched. And if we're going to be grafting or um, making a split, this is the day from which the workers will make the new queens from. And so if we're, if we're grafting, then we can time, like if I graft today on day four, then I know that I need to, like day 14 is the day that I need to remove that queen cell from that hive so that it doesn't hatch out and kill the other queens and you know that whole process uh, so day eight the queen cells capped day 16 the queen emerges now this can be it's it's i've seen it to be pretty consistent but i've heard that if you have extra warm weather the queen can hatch a day early or if you have extra cool weather the queen can hatch a day late from what i've seen when it's too cool the queens just won't hatch at all uh, or at least a lot of them won't so like this this last batch I did a, a batch earlier this month and um, it, yeah I did it on a I grafted on a nice day and then it got cold again and most of them came out okay but some of them didn't hatch so uh, there's that and then so everybody knows after the queen emerges she's gonna take about four or five days she's gonna eat a lot her her exoskeleton is gonna harden up and she's gonna get ready to go on her mating flights which she does for a couple of days depending on how well that works and day 25 is j just about the earliest you're gonna see a queen laying eggs a lot of times she'll take quite a bit longer than that she might take another week or two before she starts laying eggs so uh, don't be too antsy but it, it does happen now at this point 
in, in commercial queen rearing, as soon as she should be laying eggs, they will cage her up and ship her, put her with a package, put her with a nuke, whatever. Uh, the problem with this is, the theory goes at least anyway, that if the queen doesn't have time to get her ovaries and all the systems in there regulated into a, a steady egg laying regime, her biology, her, her organs, things will go wrong and they'll be stunted and it'll, it'll shorten her life and it will um, reduce her ability in the future to, to continue laying eggs through a normal lifespan. And so uh, for myself, for people who care more about it, for we want to wait until, you know, around 40, day 46 on my calendar here. Um, at this point, everything in her body is, is regulated and she can be uh, caged and shipped and it won't have much, if any, of an effect on her overall laying ability for the rest of her life. So I try to do this. This is why um, people who sell treatment-free queens are going to cost a whole lot more because they care about this sort of thing. And so, I mean, you can tell by the math, they're producing, you know, given the same equipment, given the same operation, they'd be producing only a little more than half of the total number of queens as a normal commercial queen rear would be. So the, the commercial guys, they just kind of deal with the fact of life that some of their queens weren't going to work anyway and so they'll they're just happy to replace them they'll just send you another one but if we want a good quality queen we want to let her lay for a good long time before doing any of that other stuff with her so your basic walk away split this is the one that everybody should start with is um, basically you just take half the hive and separate it and whichever half doesn't have the queen will make a new queen and you will have two hives. Now there's some other extra things that you can do like um, if you if you want to move the new hive or well yeah if you want to move the new hive more than two miles away or somewhere away so that the foragers from that hive don't end up back in the old hive that is helpful because um, just splitting any hive, a lot of the bees are going to end up back in the original location because the foragers are going to come back there and it's going to leave the new hive a little weaker. So one of the things, if you can't move the hive further away, one of the things that you can do, and if, you can, if you're able to find the queen, is if you put the queen in the new hive and put the new hive right next to the old hive, the that queen and her pheromones and her smell will attract more of the returning um, forager bees and so that will help to equalize the population a little bit better between those two hives. That also by doing that um, if you have a lot of depending on how you divide up the brood if you put a lot of the capped brood in the old hive in the queen in the new hive with just a little a bit less we leave most of the brood all the cat brood and, and a lot of the other brood in the old hive that hive is now going to have about three weeks maybe even four weeks where they're not having to raise new brood and so they're going to bring in a bumper crop of honey because they don't they're not having to feed anybody they can just bring in honey and so you can maintain your honey production in a hive that you've split you can prevent swarming and everything works well. Now there's one major downside to this and that's that as everybody knows when a hive makes a new batch of queens well, generally only one of them survives the process. That means we've spent three or four weeks with a hive putting all this energy into making new queens and the first one that hatches out kills all the rest of them. Now this is good for natural selection, good for finding the strongest queens, the strongest genetics, but if we're trying to make a bunch of splits really efficiently, we're kind of throwing away a lot of our queens. So this, what we have here is um, 
One year I did, before I started doing some other stuff that I'm going to start talking about here in a minute, I made, I, th I think in, in this batch I split four hives. And they were all sitting right next to each other and they were all split the same day. So I went out at this, whatever day was appropriate and found all these dead queens because queens are a bit bigger than workers. Normally when a hive is getting rid of dead workers, they'll fly them away as much as they can, but they don't seem to be able to carry away queens because they're heavier. So I was able to find all these dead queens. And I really like the dark ones. I think they're pretty. I don't, I don't have a preference myself. People ask me what breed of bees I try to use. I don't, just whatever survives. But I think the black ones are pretty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but without weakening the main hive or what? Yeah, the question is if you're if you split a hive and the old hive is making new queens, can you further split that up? And the answer is yes. Um, it will make those resulting nucleus hives weaker. Mm -hmm. They're not going to have that big um, st uh, store of brood. Yeah, the air force. They're not going to have the, the workers to be able to build up as quickly. They will still build up and it, it can work pretty well. It does depend on your conditions, yearly conditions. And the size of the hive. And the size of the hive. Like uh, when I <coughs> when I uh, was making nukes in Arkansas, all it took in my queen castles, you know, three frames, all it really took was one frame of brood and one frame of honey and a queen cell. And that was all that they needed in the spring. Yeah. Because there was such a bumper crop of nectar in the spring that I didn't have to feed them. Uh, they didn't have to work very hard. They could build up very quickly. Here, I've found that it's been not so easy. So here I do two frames of brood and one frame of honey. And that seems to be enough to get them. And it needs to be early enough in the year so that they've still got plenty of time to collect nectar before our summer dearth. Which So if the queen cells are still capped, can that still be moved? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, as long as, well, when the when the first queen hatches, then the whole batch is done. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm timing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, I have a little Excel spreadsheet that you can download from my website that will give you a full queen calendar of several methods so that you can follow the whole process. So what I do, um, I have it saved in uh, my Google Sheets, whatever the Google version of Excel is. Um, and so what I do is I go in there and I make a copy and I put the, you know, whatever batch or whatever date it is that I'm going to be doing this batch of queens on. And uh, you can choose the date. You, you input the date that you want to do the grafting or the split or wh whatever you're doing. And then it'll tell you when the new queens will be hatching. And it'll give you plenty of time to make all the preparations you need to. So yeah, check that out on my website. You can download that. It's a it's a spreadsheet. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you can get it on my website, which is parkerbees.com. So, another method which is really good and uh, is can be very successful and is very successful if you're starting with a queen that you've purchased or. Uh, gotten from a friend or whatever uh, is is what I call a shaken nuke I don't none of these names really mean mean anything you know there's there's no standard names pretty much in beekeeping so with what what the benefit of this one is is again you're not going to need to find the queen and um, most of the bees that are going to be in your split are going to be 
house bees. They haven't been outside, so they won't fly back to the old hive. So what you do is you take, you take your hive apart, you shake out all the bees, you can either you can shake them into in front of the in front of the hive they'll crawl back in or you can shake them into the empty box however you want to do it then you put a queen excluder on top of that and then whatever brood you want to be as part of your new hive your split will go into the box on top of the queen excluder now over the next couple of hours pretty quickly actually your nurse bees will go up through the queen excluder and cover the brood because that's their main job that's what they want to do once that's done you can take that box off and either put a queen in it or let them raise their own queen and that will reduce a lot of first of all again you don't have to find the queen and it'll reduce a lot of the flyback to the original hive okay so that one's pretty easy you can also i've seen people do it with a five frame nuke so what they'll do is they'll make like a little adapter that sits on top of a hive with a with a th then a, a five frame nuke sits on top of that so that or you can when i've tried to adapt different hive sty styles or box sizes i'll just put like a board on top of it just to keep it closed yes do you have to worry about the temperature then because the bees the brood could get too cold, couldn't they, while well, all this is happening? Yeah, the question is, do you have to worry about the temperature while you're splitting for the brood? If, as long as it's not too cold, like above 60, 65 degrees, it's not generally a problem. If you're leaving the hive all apart for half an hour, that's not good. But um, in the process of, of moving things around, it shouldn't generally be a problem. And having the, having the split hive on top of the other one, it's going to be heated by the other one until such time as the, the uh, nurse bees come up and cover the brood. So it's not, it's chilled brood from what I've seen generally only happens in a, um, in a situation where there's not enough bees in the cluster to cover the brood. And so when you get a cold night, they will cluster tight together to keep everything warm. And then anything on the outside of that is what will get chilled. Um, bee larvae aren't too sensitive to temperature on a short term. You know, I've, I was out grafting a couple weeks ago and it was like 55 degrees. And I'm, you know, literally picking up individual larvae and, and you know, so they, if, if they could have gotten cold, they would but most of the queens made it so it's i don't think they're quite as sensitive on a, on a, on a short-term basis it's it's chilled brood really happens in a in a situation over a cold night usually i think all right here's a fun one and this is the same if you just happen to find a hive that is getting ready to swarm so if you want to encourage a swarm by not supering or keeping the hive fairly small um, and then just watching it to see if it has swarm cells when those swarm cells happen and they don't have to be even capped already if they're, if they're building swarm cells and you look into the cell and you see a larva or an egg um, a lot of times different strains of bees will keep um, swarm they'll make cell cups queen cups and they but you'll look in them they won't have anything in them happens to me all the time I always I always take a look it's like okay they're they built a cup but there's nothing in it so they're not ready to go yet but if they do have something in it if it's got an egg or a larva in it then you know that they're getting ready to swarm and so then you can you can split up the hive into as many nukes as you have cells um, again this is temperature dependent you don't want to you don't want to split them up too much so that you know like a single frame of brood with just some bees on it probably not going to stay warm enough in a in a in a slightly cold night and so they're gonna they're not going to work very well they might fail um, so you might want 
two frames of brood or you might want to shake off an extra frame of, of nurse bees in there or something like that. Uh, and this, uh, that's one of the other benefits of the queen castle is that because the three or f my, my version are, are three by three, three three frame nukes, but they also sell a four by two, four two frame nukes, and those are usually the deep style. Um, because the divider between the nukes are so thin, mine uses five millimeter Luan plywood. They can kind of keep each other warm. So they'll, that whole box will stay warmer than an individual little nuke would have. See what I'm saying? Any questions? This is like the fewest questions I've ever had. I'm afraid I'm being too <laughs> concise or something. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So when it says, can pet cells from the maybe I missed Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, what that means is if you have, a lot of times you'll have multiple cells on the same frame. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do is take a small knife and cut out a little area around that cell, usually, I don't know, inch and a half, two inches wide. And then you can take that cell and put that with some frames that didn't have a queen cell on them. And so, uh, how do you attach it? Who said that? I did. Okay. How do you attach it? How do you attach cutting it? That, cutting that cell out. You would just, yeah, you would just squeeze it between, just gently squeeze it, not enough to smash it, but just enough to hold it between two frames. And that works pretty well. Yes? Are you I use a combination of both. I like, to, uh, I like to put foundation in my swarm traps just so that I don't have to keep them level or anything. But I also like to use foundationless also. Yeah, if you're foundationless, it is easier to cut the cut the cell out, especially if you don't have wires, or if you use something like um, fishing line or something that's easier to cut. If you have wires, it can be hard. But usually, you know, if if there's a if you have a frame with wires, usually some of them you'll be able to cut, other ones not so much. Um, and if if you can't cut, if if you know if they have two queen cells and that's just a better chance that everything will work fine. If you have a if you have swarm cells that don't hatch or the queen doesn't come back from her mating flight, you can just then recombine those little nukes with other ones and and you can build back up to bigger hives again. So the supersedure cells is the same sort of thing, except for um, you know that swarm cells are generally found at the bottom edges of comb, whereas supersedure cells are found more in the center of the comb. And that's really the only difference. Uh, and this would also be if you were to take the queen out and leave the hive to make a bunch of cells and then split them up from that point, it would be the same sort of situation. So now we're getting into even more efficient methods, and this is where we are. Thus far, we've looked at splitting a hive into two, but you lose a lot of the queens. And then we looked at splitting the hive into more than two, trying to use more of those queens to make more hives with. Now we're going to artificially increase the number of queens that we make in the whole batch. Okay? Um, so this would be, like I mentioned earlier, with the, the supersedure cell. But the commercial method is to do what's called grafting, which I'll show you a video of here in a second, where you scoop a, this would be good, you're gonna take your comb, you're gonna scoop a larva out of a cell. You're gonna, you're gonna try to get about, about the youngest larva you can possibly scoop, because that larva will be less than a day old. You're gonna place that in a, queen cup. Is it a larva or an egg? The larva. Larva. It has to be a larva. Yeah. Eggs don't scoop, I don't think. They're kind of stuck. Okay. Yeah, the larva is going to be kind of swimming around in a little puddle of royal jelly, and so you can scoop underneath and get them out. Uh, the things you don't want to do is you don't want to flip the larva over because they'll drown. They're actually, they're supposed to stay on one side. 
Um, so the, what the commercial guys do is they, they graft first, and then they take those swarm cells and they'll put them in a uh, queenless cell builder. So they'll, they'll take like a, usually a five frame nuke with four frames of, how do they do that? Four frames of open brood. So you want bees that are making a lot of royal jelly because the queen is fed on all royal jelly and you want as much royal jelly packed into the queen cell as possible. She'll only eat as much as she can eat. And so if you, if you have queens that are hatching out and there are extra, you look in there, there's extra chunks of royal jelly in there, that's good. That means she got all she could eat and that's as good as she's gonna get. Uh, so they shake in a bunch of extra nurse bees and they, the first several days, they keep the queen cells in there and they'll, they'll often put um, they'll have like these normal frames have like it's a normal frame with three cell bars that's what I use but with those they'll put like six cell bars on the same frame because they're just trying to get the cells started and get those cells packed with royal jelly and then they'll move that oftentimes to a queen right cell finisher where actually if, if there's if there's you know like 60 queen cells on there they'll move it into two split them up in half and put them in two queen finishers and then they will finish feeding close the cells and then they'll take the cells out put them in an incubator and then right before they hatch they will move those queen cells to mini mating nukes have you all seen the mini mating nukes they're about the size of a toaster um, I should have a picture of that shouldn't I so they're they're called mini mating nukes. They are about the size of a toaster. They're made out of styrofoam. They usually have three little wooden top bars in them. And they can put like a cup of nurse bees and a queen cell in there. And that will be enough for the queen to hatch, fly out and get mated and come back. And at the appropriate time, they will come along, remove that queen, cage her, and put another queen cell in there. Now, as long as they can continue that process throughout the year, throughout the, the active season, they can produce a huge number of queens. But as we talked about before, they can't actually allow that queen to continue laying in that hive because it's so small. Like the hive itself is like a large grapefruit. It's very tiny in volume. So a queen, even a new queen, can lay that much volume of eggs in a day. And then she's out of space. What do hives do that run out of space? They swarm. Now you've lost your queen and you've got really nothing left to work with because the hive was so small to begin with. So this is why I use the, uh, the queen castles as my mating nukes. Because even if, um, even when my queen hatches out and starts to lay, she's got three, most of three frames to lay up. Because if I put two frames of brood, one frame of honey in there, a good portion of that honey will have been used up by the time she starts laying. And all the brood in those two brood frames has also hatched by the time she starts laying. So she's got a lot of empty space. I can get in there, I can see how full she's laid it. Um, and then I can, if she's doing really well, I can move that three frame nuke into a five frame box, add her two more frames of uh, I can add two frames of brood from other hives to make it to make her grow quickly, more quickly, or I can just add empty comb, or if I don't have that, I can do empty frames or foundation, and depending on how fast I want them to build up. Um, the last couple of years, I've had a lot of empty comb sitting around, so I could always put empty comb in there. Uh, optimally, I'd be looking for. All my, all my comb would be working somewhere, so I would be wanting to put empty frames or foundation in there. And uh, those nukes, if they're building, especially with a new queen, she's going to be laying, like, fast. When she first starts out, she, it, she'll, a lot of times you'll see a queen, a new queen will lay multiple eggs in each cell, because she's just, like, shooting them off, right? Um, and then she'll, later on she'll slow down and she'll figure out how to regulate her output and things will be great. So that's why I like to use the, um, 
the queen castles for mating nukes, and also because there's no odd cell size, there's no uh, odd frame size. The mini mating nukes, like they have a little, a little top bar that's maybe, I don't know, what, four or five inches long? And so at the end of the year, after you've produced your latch last round of queens, you're going to have this stuff sitting around. You, you know, if you store it somewhere, you're going to have to worry about wax moths, and you, you can't reincorporate that into another hive because it's not a frame. Uh, and even even some of the the older style mating nukes before they came up with the mini mating nukes used half or third size frames. And again, that's an odd size frame, so you have to have a special setup to keep those in a special box. So I just like the mating nukes because at the end of the season, whatever happens, I can take all those normal size frames, put them back into normal size hives, and not have to worry about it. So a quick word about drones. One of the concerns that I hear is that people are concerned when they're trying to be treatment free or develop their own treatment free stock. They're concerned about selective breeding. They're concerned that the local commercial drones from everybody's tr uh, treated package hives are going to affect their queens that, that are going out to mate. Now there's a couple things to remember. Number one, you're not treating your bees and so you have healthier bees. And, and a number of studies have shown that various treatments have sometimes even severe effects on, uh, I guess the technical term is drone fecundity. The, uh, the effectiveness of the sperm and the drone, the effectiveness of the drone to be able to fly after the queen and mate with her. And so, in the beginning, your drones already have a leg up on the drones in the neighborhood, right? So if you're, uh, especially if you're foundationless and you allow your hives to have plenty of drone comb, you're going to be producing plenty of drones which are going to be out-competing the local drones in the area, at least somewhat. The other thing is, um, you don't need every bee in the hive to have a certain set of traits to be a treatment-free, a sustainable treatment-free hive. You really only need a portion of the drone fathers of the workers in that hive to have a mixture of traits that will help the hive survive in the face of Varroa or other diseases, right? Because there's so many bees in a hive and there's so many different fathers for all those bees, you know, 20, I've lately heard even people say as, man, as many as 50 different drones mate with the queen. But let's just say 20 because that's the, the conventional number. Um, you really only need, you know, maybe a quarter of the bees to be able to do things like uh, hygienic behavior, um, Mite biting, uh, where's the other ones? Suppressed mite reproduction, varroa sensitive hygiene. Like you, you really only need a portion of the workers to be able to carry out those tasks to give the hive immunity to those diseases. Right? So you don't have to control everything. And there's an important thing to remember that in 25 years since, I gotta keep track of my time. So Varroa was introduced to the United States in the early 90s, 91 to 93, somewhere around there. So it's been about 25 years. And in that time, with all of the instrumental insemination and people who actually are able to create isolated mating areas with, with selected drones, um, with um, mite tests and hygienic behavior tests and all those tests and all that breeding, no commercial beekeeper has produced a treatment-free bee. Right? Even, even probably some of the best bees around, uh, the Minnesota hygienic bees, they're still not treatment-free when it comes to varroa mites. They're really good when it comes to American foul brood, but not to mites. To be able to deal with mites, you need a much broader set of traits 
and a mix of traits. A single trait is not going to do the job. And we've seen with other animals what happens when we try to breed too specifically for too specific a trait. Um, you know, one of the, the common things is with, with different breeds of dogs. You know, dachshunds tend to have back problems. Rottweilers tend to get cancer. Uh, chihuahuas act like chihuahuas. <laughs> They're, like it's a tiny dog that thinks it's big and so it like attacks every, anyway. <laughs> when we breed for specific traits, especially um, well, one of the ones that Michael Bush likes to mention is draft horses, which for so many years were bred to pull things because that's what draft horses do. But once it no longer became necessary to pull things, they started being bred for looking like a draft horse. And now draft horses aren't really good at pulling things much anymore because they weren't bred for it anymore. They're bred for how they look. So we, we have to be careful with... Uh, with, with being too specific in what we're trying to breed. That's why I, I kind of do sort of enforced ignorance. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. I purposely choose not to care about most traits when I'm, when I'm working with bees, trying to develop bees that survive well. I just work with the ones that survive and I generally focus on being nice, you know, gentle bees, because I, I want to have fun doing it, and then I work with uh, whichever hives are productive. And so by doing that, I really leave it up to the bees which traits they decide to use to make all that happen. I don't really have to care. Just so long as they're doing what they're supposed to, that's all I care about. So you can, and also, I, it's really good that, uh, according to my, my sort of informal surveys on my, my YouTube or Facebook group, um, it seems like pretty much 75% of treatment-free beekeepers are using either all foundationless or uh, top bar style, which is by definition foundationless, or at least some foundationless. So 75% of treatment-free beekeepers are using at least some foundationless, which is good because that allows the hive to use uh, or to create a more natural number of drones. And those drones are going to compete on the stage with those other drones. Okay? And because they can compete and the ferals are, are dealing with a much better um, free of interference, free of cell size manipulation, free of treatment, the ferals actually affect more of the, the commercial kept bees than the other way around. A question. Yes. Uh, uh, the drones congregation, don't they have a little congregation sawmeter mm -hmm. when they go? Have you ever seen one or what is it like? I always wonder about all these guys getting together and I have not waiting for the queen to come, you know, the virgin to come flying by. And I have not personally seen a drone congregation area. Yeah. I just wondered how all that All the scientists say they exist. I've seen pictures that seem to show that. Um, you hear about what's called drone comets, where you have a queen flying and, and you see a bunch yeah, of <laughs> drones following her. But I've never personally seen it. Yeah. Okay. Was there another question? Okay. So um, this is the method that I use. You don't have to do this. Like I, like I said, this I've just kind of gone through some selected variations of basic splitting and increase methods that you can try out for yourself. But if you want to take the next step, I want to show you what I do. Um, I've tried to come up with a good name for it, but being that my name starts with a P, it's kind of hard to do acronyms. So if anybody has any ideas, that'd be great. Parker method. <laughs> Parker method. Uh, so basically what I do is on, I plan when I'm going to do my grafting day, 
which is day four, remember from the calendar. And so on day one, I will go into the hive that I'm gonna make my queens with. Oh, the other thing I need to explain is the original name, the name of the queen rearing method to which I add on to my nuke method is called uh, the Ben Hardin method. And it's a method of creating queens in a queen right hive and it was originally developed as a method to produce royal jelly for supplements and for whatever people use royal jelly for. So what you can do, what this allows you to do is to continually produce queens in the same hive, queen right hive, and continue to produce honey and, and use that hive for all the normal stuff while at the same time producing queens on a continuous basis. So what that allows us as backyard beekeepers to do is instead of having to make up a queenless hive to make a bunch of queens in, we can make just a few, you know, you don't have to make a batch of 50 queens. You can make five or 10. So you can do that in, in a hive without having to disrupt everything. Because when you make a, sometimes like when I've tried to do a queenless cell builder hive, I actually have the bees all swarm out of it and be a queenless swarm and leave my cell builder hive with no workers to, to tend the queen cells. So queenless hives can be volatile. So I want to get away from that. Um, so day four, I graft larvae into cell cups and then put those cups into the hive that I'm going to have raise the queens, which doesn't have to be the same hive that I have um, that I that I got the larvae from. So I might have a really really awesome hive that I get the larvae from, but I want to keep that hive. I want to have that hive um, make a bunch of honey. So I you know got a big old stack on it, and I don't want to have to get in there all the time and, and mess with stuff because I have to move all these boxes and they're full of honey anyway. Uh, so but I have another hive that is maybe really productive, but is maybe a little mean that I don't want to I don't want to have to be the mother of my queens but I think it would be good to make the queens. So graft the queens into the cell cups, put them into the other hive, and then wait nine days. No, yeah. Can you give me a picture of what the queen rise cell builder looks like? Because I'm, ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, because, yeah, I was, always taught that you can't get a queen right hive to build queen cells. Generally not. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to keep, um, on, on day one, I'm going to put my, put a queen excluder in there. See the queen excluder? And I'm going to put these two um, frame dummies, which look like those. They're just plywood boxes that I built to take up the space in the side of the hive because I want all the traffic and the heat and everything to go through where my queen cells are so that they stay well taken care of. You don't have to have these, but I find that they help uh, everything work. Now I'm going to make sure to keep, while I put that cell bar frame in there for the bees to get acclimated to and polish up the cells and stuff from day one to day four, the queen excluder's in there, and no queen has ever set foot on that frame, so her smell isn't on there. So the bees, and this is the way I assume it works, just knowing what I know about bee biology and bee, uh, yeah, what bees do in hives, they, they don't think like we do. Like we, when we come up with a task, we plan the task, we start doing the task, we finish the task, the task is done. Because there's so many of them in the way that they cycle through their life cycle doing different tasks, they basically come onto a job that's part done and they do some more on it and then they move on to another job. And the next bee comes along and sees a job that's part done, they work on it and they move on. So when they see these queen cell cups that are sort of already mostly built and they don't smell like the queen, there's no queen around, they think, well, maybe the queen is getting weak. Maybe she's not laying as much as she used to and, and the other bees have decided that we're going to supersede her and so I'm, we're making queen cells. 
So that's what he does, she does. Um, that's my kind of human interpretation of what's going on there. They are, they are continuing a task that somebody else started because things kind of fit how they're supposed to fit for this certain thing that's happening. It's kind of an artificial supersedure. And, and you've had success with having those queen cells that close to the queen? Yes. But I've had another <coughs> queen breeder do this similar method of talking about it, but she put it above the supers. So that it's even further from the queen and it makes it easier to get to. I have not tried that. I'm, I don't doubt that it works. Um, but like with everything, my disclaimer is that I'm just showing you how it can work. I'm not trying to tell you how to do anything. If you want to try it, that's fine. If you don't, that's also great. Try other ways. I'm, I, I'd, I'd be interested to try that and see if it works any different. It'd be good to, it'd be good to, to see, like if I have three cell bars on a frame, like how many of the bottom ones get finished. That'd be a good thing to pay attention to. Yes? So you have the young brood frame in there just to encourage nurse bees up there? Yes, to encourage nurse bees. You want to get the population of nurse bees around the queen cells who are in their stage of life where they're making queen or, or royal jelly. Because the royal jelly is the important ingredient. And my my frame dummies are a little narrower than that. I just built them the wrong size, and so my my high my box fits five frames instead of four. So what I'll do is I'll do um, pollen and honey on the outside two frames, and then brood on the inside two frames, and then cell bar frame in the middle. Okay, did I miss anything? Is anybody confused? I'm confused. <laughs> yes. I've been holding on to this question because I think maybe you missed something, but how do you know when you go into a hive and you're looking for queen cups? How do you know on what day that larva is? How do I know on what day the larva is in the queen cups? If I'm if I'm finding a, a, a queen cup a swarm cell yeah. already made, um, I guess the really the only way that I know I don't need to know too specifically because in those ones I'm not moving. The timing doesn't matter when I split them up. Like whatever stage the queen cell is at is already like there. That's going to be the queen cell anyway. Okay. Um, but. I guess just by, I can, I can make a good estimate just by the size of the larva. Um, because the, the, queen, the queen develops much more quickly than a worker larva does. And like you saw in the, the thing earlier, they get capped several days before a worker does. So they're already like this big white grub in there. Um, so yeah, you can, but, but since I'm, since I'm splitting up the hive, I'm not adding the queen cells later. Like that queen cell, whatever stage it's at, just becomes the queen cell. Because at that point, it'll be a, a queenless hive. And they're going to take whatever queen cell they already have, and that's what they're going to work with. Okay. I won't know necessarily exactly when she's going to hatch and mate and everything. You know, so I'm, it's not... I'm not going to be as concerned with if she, if eggs appear on day such and such or not. I might give it a little extra time. Or a lot of times they'll already be older and so they'll start laying earlier than I would normally expect. Any other questions? Okay, so that's the frame blanks. And if you want to make these for yourself, um, I think this picture is on my website. It's just, just basically take the the shape of a frame and build a box in that shape. So it's a half inch piece of plywood across the top and then kind of that shape. And I actually took pictures and I have all the measurements on them. I need to do a better page for that. Mm -hmm. Can you use a, uh, uh, a sugar feeder? 
in there as well. Say again. So there's this tray that you can feed sugar and water to feed with. Mm -hmm. So can you, instead of using a blank frame like you did on either side, can you put a couple of those in instead? That's actually not a bad idea. Using some uh, some frame feeders yeah. instead of blanks. Kind of the top, so they all yeah, that could work. I like that. That's a good idea. Hadn't thought about that. Might interfere with honey production if you're filled with sugar. Yeah, you'd want to keep them closed probably, because if 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 those if they were full of syrup or something, the bees are probably gonna they're gonna fill up your um, your queen cell frame with comb, and then it kind of messes up the whole situation. So a lot of people are scared of grafting. Now I look at grafting, the way that I kind of conceptualize it is I'm taking a very small spoon, say this is my very small spoon, and I'm scooping a very small Cheerio out of a very small bowl and putting it in another slightly larger bowl. That's really all that's involved with it. Right, if you, if you mess it up, if you smush the Cheerio, or you can't get the Cheerio, you just, just try again. And it's really, um, so you see some people use like those, those dental magnifying glasses or, or one of those big um, magnifying glasses with the light on it, or I just use a headlamp. Um, I've actually found a video, I couldn't, I, I couldn't find it so that I could put it in here, but Surely if this 12 year old girl can do it, you can do it. Now what she's doing first is she's pre-priming the queen cells with royal jelly, which I don't usually do. I'm, I'm, I could get better acceptance if I did, but it's not that big a deal. So, so that's what she's doing at first. Come on, play. So that's not grafting. All right, so now she's grafting. This is how fast she does it. You and I, use plastic cups or make your own wax cups. I use wax cups. Mm -hmm. So you can either buy um, you can either buy wax cups. Rossman Apiaries sells them, or you can buy a a little silicone mold or you can make your own silicone mold if you're into candle making to make wax cell cups. Uh, I like the wax because when I'm done with the whole thing I can just throw it back in the melting pot and it becomes part of the system again. Uh, with plastic you've got plastic to throw away or whatever and that just doesn't appeal to me as much. Now she's pretty fast. She's about four or five times faster than I am. I found a video of, uh, of a Chinese guy doing it in China where they make most of the world's production of royal jelly and he is two or three times faster than she is. He's like like this fast, like as fast as she is doing the, the royal jelly. It's just, I don't understand how you can do that but he did it. What do you... Okay, there we go. So here's what my queen cells look like after they're finished. And you can actually see, you can kind of see how when the queens are getting ready to hatch, the workers will chew off the outer layer of the cell here to help the queen get out of the cell and that allows her to save energy. She can get out of the cell by herself, but People have told me that that weakens the queens and it's not as good for them. So if you're hatching them in a incubator or something that might not be as good. Uh, for me, the jury's still out on that. I don't know yet. And then what I'll do, these are, these are cups that for whatever reason didn't take. And then I'll use these cell protectors um, just so that I can uh, use the little fork thing in there to stick them into the comb to hold the cell and then when the queen hatches out I'll come take that out again take the cell out of it melt the cell down and then reuse the 
the cell protector. And I'm told these can prevent, if a, if a queen hatches early, it'll prevent the queen from chewing out the side of the cell and killing the other queen. I don't know much about that. I've never had that happen yet. Fortunately, I've always kept my timing, so it hasn't happened. So if you've never seen a queen cell before, which I assume most of you have, they're pretty cool. And then, like I said before, I put the, put the ripe cell in a queen castle, two frames of brood, one frame of honey, and let the queen hatch out, start laying. Um, the queens that don't hatch or that don't come back from their mating flight, those nukes I combine with other ones to make bigger ones, five frame nukes, and then eventually they'll grow into 10 frame nukes. And depending on how many queens that I sell separate from the nukes, you know, if, if I take, um, what would I have to do, four or five? If I sell four or five queens, I take those nukes and combine them back with one that I didn't sell, and now I have a double deep hive, or double medium in this case. And eventually they grow up a little bigger. This, I included this picture because this was, um, I didn't get to, it was a really good year, and I didn't get back into the queen castles quick enough to expand them, and the queens laid up them full of brood and several of them swarmed and this is one that swarmed and landed in a bush in my backyard and I caught the swarm and so I got an extra swarm out of the deal. It was kind of funny because I caught the swarm and closed up the hive and then they swarmed out of that again and I had to go catch them again and that time I took the queen and put her in a cage and kept her in the box so she wouldn't fly away and so that was good. Ended up keeping that one but I did lose I saw one that I lost, like it swarmed out and like went over the, was just flying, it was really beautiful, see all these bees flying through the air the other way. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions before we take another quick break? Can I bother you to go back to the Parker Method slide? Sure. <laughs> this one? Uh, one, this one? Yeah, that one. I think I interrupted you when you were explaining this one. Did I skip something? I try not to read my presentations. I think that's bad form. So I talk and you read. One other method I think I accidentally left out of here is if you have a number of hives, you can take one frame of brood out of each of them and create a new hive as if it were a split. But because you're only taking one or maybe two frames out of each of, one of each of those hives, they're much quicker able to recover from that and you don't lose production out of it. So if you want to keep, um, if you want to do everything in five frame nukes, you know, you take five five frame nukes, one frame out of each of them, start a new nuke, they can make a new queen. Um, and you can actually do that about once a week throughout the season because a five frame nuke will be able to fill a new frame in in a week or maybe two depending on the conditions and the bees get along all right with that? yes they're, just nurse bees and they're mostly nurse bees but i've found that when you if you're combining hives it's a lot more helpful to put if you say you're combining two hives mm -hmm. you want to put them into a third box you don't want to take one and put it onto another hive. Once they realize, and you'll, you'll hear this if you take a, a frame out of a hive and put it in like an empty box, you'll hear the sound, you'll hear them change. They'll change very quickly within a couple of seconds. They're, because they know that they're not in their home anymore, they have nothing to defend and so they, they don't fight anymore.